My name is David Temple. I'm the Associate Curator of Paleontology here at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. And today we're going to be in my home environment, our Paleo Lab. When you said home environment, you really weren't lying. This definitely no. is a, this is a nest. And because of insurance regulations, I do have to be very specific and say it's not generating heat. <laughs> So actually some archaeologists could come through here and actually study the layers they of could. your nest. They could, the layers of the nest, and they would know they could find things that are, say, maybe from December, or maybe things that are from January. David, would this be the most geekiest part of the museum? The, the geekery in here is significant, yes. You can probably, if you breathe deep, you can inhale the geekery. What are these people working on right now? Okay, so we built this lab, what, 13 months ago? You were in here mm -hmm. as a journalist. Yes. You came in and joined us. Uh, we built it 13 months ago, and of course, what we, we do prepare fossils, and we prepare them in view of the public, so we want them to see sort of science as a verb. So this is the action, this is where the rubber hits the road, and you, I've always had this dream for like 10 or 12 years, but you can't just start up doing it. You have to have people that know what they're doing. You have, if you're going to prep fossils, you have to train the people to prep the fossils. So really, you have to start at ground zero. So this young lady right here, what she's working on is a sort of a training project. We start people out working them on a green river fish. And as you know, because you were in here. I've worked on one of these. And you worked on one of those. So I thought that was the best way to do it in a journalist sense, was to let them actually do it. Uh, you start out with this. Of course, we know there's a fish in there. And by the time you're finished prepping it, you've teased all the rock off of this. So the way to do this, of course, is you have to work very carefully in the standard tool that most people use. In fact, she's using one right now. It's just a pin vise with a carbide needle. So it's a really sharp needle. And of course, the other secret ingredient to doing this is magnification, having a microscope. That's absolutely necessary. And if you work on one of these for long enough, folks, your fingers vibrate. They so do. You, it's hard to drive because you're just like... Because you're constantly <laughs> focused yeah, and doing yeah. it. How many people work in this area at any we, given time? We have 60 or so volunteers that have signed up, and at any given time, we usually only have three. So we have, we, I call this the big top. This is where all the action happens. These would be the public. Uh, it's right across the front here. So we have cameras. If you're out there, you can actually see in real time what the person at this station is doing. Do you ever just bang on the window? I have done Get that back before. To work. Yeah. I've done that before, yeah. but I don't, you don't have to bang on the window because you can actually press the red button over there, and it, it, then they can hear everything in here. Uh, you can say "back to work, you." <laughs> you know, stop, stop gold bricking, or stop messing up. Go over there and press the red button and speak, or green button. I'm sorry, green for go. Press the button and speak into the little microphone. There. How do you do it? How do we do it? We do a whole bunch of stuff in here, so and that's what we're doing this video about is all the things that we work on in here. So what she's working on now is a fish, and she's using a microscope. If you don't use magnification, if you make a mistake, it's going to be a big mistake. So she is learning how to prep fossils and looking under a microscope with a hard steel needle. She is slowly removing grain after grain of rock. This brown thing right there, what do you think the brown thing is right there? No, that's not the fish. It's called a trace fossil. It's something that the fish made. What do fish make? They, well, sometimes they do. This particular stuff that she's working on, it's called coprolite. It's poop. You're looking at 52 million year old poop. Hey, uh, David, can I get a, a number two with onion rings and a uh, milkshake? Uh, yes, we'll get you that. We haven't heard that one before. Now, of course, Chuck here is decked out in a special safety gear for the Paleo Prep Lab. You have quite the collection here. Are these all your books? Uh, they're now pretty much the museum's books. They were my books, yes, but I have since passed them on. So this is our Paleo Library. And this is a small fragment of it, actually. We have a lot more in storage, but we try to take the things that we would refer to the most, you know, the things that are most useful and put them out. Now, the question a lot of people have when it comes to the Paleo Prep Lab here, how often do we see Dr. Robert Bacher? We see him often in our hearts, but he's not really in Houston too often. But we do see him whenever we go dig uh, in Seymour, when we go to our field area, uh, he meets us there and digs there with us. But he does come to Houston, usually it's once a year or so. And if you guys know your Dr. Robert Bacher history, this is actually the Life magazine that got him into paleontology. paleontology. Yeah. September 7th, 1953. He would have been eight years old, I think, or thereabouts, and an eight-year-old child read that magazine. And we actually do have a copy of the magazine. And um, it changed his life. Got him interested in dinosaurs and 
Uh, he is where he is today. Bigger question, what got you into dinosaurs? And what got me into it is I went to a show here, went to the Houston Gym and Mineral Society show, and I was there with a guy that used to work here that was a paleontologist named Ephraim Dixon. And he showed, was telling me about some of the fossils and he handed me a jaw of a rhinoceros. And the jaw of the rhinoceros was maybe this, this big. So it meant that you know, we could be holding a, a rhinoceros yeah. you know, that might be the size of a bulldog. And I saw that jaw and it, just, it blew me away. So it really wasn't dinosaurs so much as it was mammals. And ironically, when I was a small child, the thing I obsessed with wasn't dinosaurs either. It was this thing. And I kind of forgot about it. And now, you know, flash forward 45 years later, and this is what we work with. This is what I work mostly on, or Dimetrodon. Now, I understand that we have a Dimetrodon here in the back room. We do. That we're working on right now, named Baby Neo. Let's go check it out. Now, this jacket includes Baby Neo, which was a baby Dimetrodon that we grabbed from our Seymour dig site. Yes, that's and, correct. And we're trying to sift Baby Neo out of this right now. Uh, not so much sift, what you do is we'll take a small tool, like a pin vise, like we saw them working on there, and you work the rock off of it. So at this point, almost all the dirt has been removed. We did keep all the dirt, and we run it through a fine sieve, because we don't, I mean, Baby Neo is important, but what we want to save is anything that lived with Baby Neo. So you find tiny little toes, you find tiny little teeth. Again, the overall goal is to reconstruct the entire ecosystem. And you can see we've actually removed quite a bit of it. Uh, this is what it looked like with all the, the numbered bones before. So there's, we've pulled out uh, probably close to maybe 100 bones, and then a lot of them we've already cleaned. So these are coated with kind of a hard carbonate rind, and here's one of the thin spines that had the rind on it. And so now it's been cleaned. So this was done the same way we saw in the lab with, with a needle with the vibrating air so with the pin vice. And so here would have been on here. Right, and what's really cool and what's kind of weird about it, if you notice the odd shapes, so in the models, when you see models like this, they always do a great job of making that Dimetrodon fin be really straight, and it's very symmetrical and it tracks across and all that. But in reality, these things had all kinds of problems. So you can see that was bent like that, and that didn't probably happen in the paleontological record. It was probably like that in life. So fins, sometimes you find them where they break, and then they healed, or they get bent. So these things would have appeared a little bit different um, than what you see here, and that, that fin might not have been so perfect. So the other one that we're working on, uh, we've been working on it for many years with Dr. Bacher, is one that's named Willie. And the fin on that one, it not only moves like this, you know, it not only curves back, but it also does this. So it's very, very strange, kind of an organic shape. How long ago did Baby Neo live? Baby Neo would have been uh, middle early Permian, so about 282 to 287 is our best estimate of the dates. So, and this is in Texas. So this guy right here is an original Texan. You do find a lot of really nice Dimetrodons in Texas. We don't have a lot of dinosaurs that you find in Texas, but for Permian stuff, we do, Texas is a lot of, a lot of resources. All right, now this guy has caught my eye for obvious reasons. Yes, they're Who very is this? unique. <laughs> this is an animal called uh, Diplocolis, and these you find, they're in Texas, and we've got some that we excavated at our Seymour site. In fact, we found quite a few of these in different sizes, and this is a one-to-one -one life model of one that we excavated. Its name is Jeff. And these things, they're so unusual, and they're so iconic, and they're so weird that they've popped up now in sort of popular culture as part of the internet fraud thing. So people are posting very lifelike pictures of these things that they've photoshopped. And in one case, there's one that's in a red bucket and this guy said he caught it on a cane pole with a worm and he's saying, does anybody know what this is? And it's just a model that they put in a bucket and they photographed. And there's another one, this is from East Texas, where he said he saw this in the creek and didn't know what it was. And he, so he posted that online asking, did anybody does anybody know what this thing what is? What was that actually? This is uh, probably fiberglass. Okay. <laughs> so the other thing that we do in here is because we are restoring skeletons, we do 3D printing. So some cases, like in some cases, like let's say Willy, we've got a really solid part of the muzzle, one half of it, but the other half, when we excavated it, it was there, but it was very friable. It probably had the consistency of maybe cigarette ash. Then you get it wet, and it's really hard to dig. So um, what we can do, of course, is you and everybody else that's watching this uh, has bilateral symmetry. Unless you have an aquarium in the room, maybe they don't. Bilateral symmetry means that 
the left is just the stereo opposite of the right. So what you do is you scan one side, then print it, and then we can use that print to restore the other side of the skull. So we're able to complete the muzzle. And so in some cases, for instance, we're, we have a right hand, but we don't have a left hand. We don't have the, the right side. So we scan it, flip it, print it, and then we can use that on the other side of the skeleton. So there you have it, folks. Next time you're here in the Morian Hall of Paleontology, check out the Fossil Prep Lab. We're open 363 days a year, and the next day we will not be open is going to be Thanksgiving.